We've all heard the story, I guess, since kindergarten of Pandora's box. You open a box and all the ills of the world come out. Um, is Pandora evil to do this? Um, stupid? Is this something that she perhaps would have been better off not to have done? It's an old um, illustration of the axiom, or the saw, I guess. It's not really an axiom. The saw that ignorance is bliss. Um, that the more you know, the more ugly things get. Um, therefore, it might be better not to know. I mentioned in a previous video just a couple of days ago about uh, the opening line of The Call of Cthulhu, where Lovecraft says one of the most merciful things um, in the world is our inability to actually correlate all the contents of our minds. Um, and that if we actually did um, learn exactly what's going on um, in the cosmos of which we are a part, we would probably go insane or deliberately blot out um, all our new knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. There are many variants on that story, on that theme. Um, instead of just being horrified by what we learn, or shocked, as in Pandora or um, Lovecraft's first-person narr narrator in The Call of Cthulhu, there are people who say that when you learn certain things, when you play with certain forbidden matches, I guess, not only are your fingers going to be burned, but you're going to burn everybody else's fingers as well. Um, mentioned Ray Bradbury's Golden Apples of the Sun, he wrote another short story called The Flying Machine, where the Emperor of China one morning sees a guy flying through the air in this large elaborate kite. Um, and the, um, the inventor has just invented it because he thought, wow, look at this. I, I, it's my normal turn of mind to um, invent things. So I've just invented this, and he shows it to the Emperor. The Emperor likes the machine, but he orders it burned, and he orders the inventor executed. He has his head chopped off. Why? Well, that damn flying machine has the potential of wrecking the Great Wall of China. You build a big enough one of those, and you can use it to carry large enough stones to smash the Great Wall of China to atoms. And look what happens when we do that. The barbarians pour in, the Mongols or the Huns or the Russians or whomsoever we're afraid of. Uh, it's another um, variant on the same theme. It goes back to Socrates being forced to drink poison um, because of the implications of what he was doing. He was um, accused of turning wrong into right. Um, we have um, other examples of this when Galileo, the story of Galileo, and he says, e por si muove, where he was <coughs> brought before either the Inquisition or the Pope, I can't remember, um, and, say, and, and advised that, okay, you have to recant on your heliocentric view of the solar system. It we must have a terra-centric view of the solar system. Never mind what your science says. If we allow that Aristotle, I think it was Aristotle, has made such a fundamental error, it throws all of our knowledge, of which Aristotle is an anchor, into question, and suddenly nobody is sure of anything. So they pressured Galileo, so goes the tale, to admit that the sun moves around the earth. And as he sort of signed the confession, or whatever he, want, whatever he did, he said, um, e por si muove. And yet it moves. In other words, the earth is moving relative to the sun, regardless of what you force me to say. In extreme cases, you get people who will say that, and I mentioned this before and uh, a while back, uh, just a week or so ago, 
you get um, regimes who have in the past have put people in mental hospitals because of what they actually believe. They believe that they're living in a repressive society, whereas the regime says, no, we're living in a utopia. It's obvious that somebody who would argue with utopia is insane. Um, so we better put you in the nut house and pump you full of drugs and subject you to electroconvulsive therapy without knocking you out first and force you to take scalding and freezing baths one after the other, etc. Um, well, okay. Um, e pur si muove. Uh, you can torture anyone into saying anything you want them to say. It doesn't change the fundamental reality of the situation. So saying that a certain philosophy is dangerous because of its implications is, of course, a fallacy. That's an appeal to fear. It's an appeal to all kinds of things. But I see exactly these appeals being made. You mustn't believe this because the implications are horrific. Now, arguably, I'm, I'm doing the same thing right now, right? And this goes back to Heidelberg's point. You've got to apply what do you, whatever you want to call it. I'm balking at the term relativist, but you have to apply relativism to relativism. You have to apply anikantavada to anikantavada. You have to apply siadvada to siadvada. You have to apply the sevenfold theory of maybe to itself in order to avoid dogmatism. You have to constantly change your point of view. Now, another point is I'm being, it is being implied that I am cutting at the knees of logic. I am not. I cannot say this enough. I'm not doing that. I am simply broadening my perspective. If we're to discuss logic, we'd better make sure that we, in, that we include all versions of logic in that. Otherwise, we're not being logical, are we? I take Western logic, and in particular, I take the three fundamental or three classical laws of logic. Identity, the excluded middle, and non-contradiction. And I don't say that they are absolute rubbish. I just widen the sweep of my lens a little bit and say there are systems of logic that do not depend on these. And, or at least they don't depend on them to the extent that the Western one does. Because the Western one has a tendency, or I shouldn't say the logical system, but the way some people use it, has a tendency to lead us to blind alleyways. I mentioned, and I, I'm going to get accused of making an odious comparison here, but it's just the most obvious one that I can think of. The antinatalist takes an axiom that says suffering is to be avoided. That seems obvious. It just seems so unarguable that it's obvious. And they turn that into a solid moral imperative that is completely and utterly unarguable. Um, and any number of means are used to, by some people to emphasize the importance of this one axiom and to turn it into an absolute. Denunciation being um, the most glaring, glaringly obvious um, means of uh, emphasizing how important this is. How would you like to suffer? Are you bringing suffering in, you know, into existence? Are you causing the suffering of others? You know, you horrible person, etc., etc., etc. But there are other ways. I, I mentioned J. Philippe Rushton. He took a seemingly innocuous axiom that intelligence exists and that race exists and that we can, we can measure intelligence. And he came up with, well, we know what he came up with, this crazy pile of rubbish called race realism. Um, you know, I always say some people simply can't be trusted with axioms because of what they will do with them. Now, Nicholas de Silentio is saying that, well, what you're doing is you're creating a situation of endless conflict because you're saying that there's no way to win a debate because we've dispensed with the ideas of right and wrong. Really? Okay. I would argue, I would counter that, and I'm not saying that, you're, that that's an invalid um, objection, by the way. I'm addressing that objection because it needs to be addressed. If you listen to the speeches of a guy by the name of Abimael Guzman, who is who was the head, he's now in prison, of the Shining Path um, in Peru, this horrible um, Maoist insurgency that took place in Peru in the 1990s mostly, 
kind of similar to Khmer Rouge in the 1970s. They do not... The, the, the writings of this guy, of Abimel Guzman, it's, it's so certain, he's saying every last atom in the cosmos is unerringly pointing towards the rightness of what I am saying. And anyone saying otherwise is defective. And because the stakes are so high that people are being so horribly repressed all the time, killed, murdered, tortured, etc., I am in the right to simply kill anyone who disagrees with me. Because they are not only are they wrong, but they're dangerous. And what you get in that case is, you know, as we saw in Democratic Campuchia, you get the killing fields, or you get the mind-blowing brutalities of the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. Um, or, again, you get the Nazis. Now, again, I know what people are going to say here. They're going to say, you're invoking God, Godwin's Law just to deliberately muddy the waters here or whatever and it, well okay if you want to look at it that way that's fine um, I would say that no it's not me who is up the ante here it's you who is up the up the ante by insisting on absolutes and I'm saying this is where absolutes will go because um, again Nicholas de Silentio is saying well we we need absolutes or otherwise we'll have chaos and Hobbesian chaos at, at that it's kind of a intellectual version of the Leviathan. We have to have absolute truths to keep people in awe of them, or else we will have insanity. We will have just nothing but endless clashing of wills violently and in a completely uncoordinated manner. Possibly. But order can be just as deadly as chaos can. As I say, ask uh, someone who lived in Russia during the 1930s just how harmless an extreme fixation with order and truth can be or somebody who lived through the Spanish Inquisition, what that can be, what an extreme fixation with order and um, rationality, as understood by the people involved, can actually lead to. Um, I hate to do it, but look at the Nazis. They, they did this. Now, I am not saying that one view of reality, an absolutist versus a non-absolutist, version of reality is superior to the other. What I'm saying is both views exist and both views have advantages and disadvantages. The Jains are the ones who are best known for things like Ahimsa, which is non-violence, non-harming really, and Anekantavada, which is the theory of multiple or multiplicity of viewpoint. These people are, I guess you would say, are almost the ultimate relativists, and yet they're the most peaceful people because of their powerful adherence to Ahimsa. There are hospitals in India where they pick up injured rats and bring them in and nurse them back to health. They take their vegetarianism and their non-violence so seriously that they do stuff like this and they actually follow the precepts of this philosophical um, point of view that they've developed it's not just rubbish to them it's real and they actually do um, do things like fast themselves to death as a refusal to play by the rules of phenomenal reality they said we don't like it here and we're just leaving end of story I don't want to be here anymore um so, okay, you might say that it leads to absolute chaos, but I could say that it leads to absolute peace, depending on what you do with that. Um, you know, the, the, I, I'm constantly being called a relativist by Nicholas de Salentio, and I, I keep saying I'm not a relativist. I'm simply pointing out that there are other ways to look at things besides an absolutist way. I'm not saying that an absolutist view of the universe is wrong. I'm just saying that it might be right on a certain level, but kind of not appropriate on another. Um, we can actually be completely rational if we want to um, split atoms or design a dam or um, plan a city or something like this. And so this is what you know we want to do. But as for why do we want to get out of bed in the morning, that... There's no rational reason for that. Why do we want to stay alive? Why do we want to exist? There's no rational reason for that. 
the rational side can give us a how. It's the irrational side that gives us the why. Um, and we are both. If you want to sort of say one is superior to the other, then you're simply saying one half of what you are is superior to the other half, which may simply be a case of personality type. I know some people are just more cerebral than they are emotional, um, and other people are simply more emotional than they are cerebral. Um, the classic case that I like being a Canadian is the constant contrast between the English and the French in this country. The general consensus is even among, um, or at least when people are sort of being very frank with each other and very frank with themselves is the English are more efficient and more rational but the French have a life that be, might be a lot more interesting and ultimately more worth living. Which one is better? You can't really talk about one is better than the other. Um, like As I say, I look at the English Canadian from the point of view of the French Canadian. The French Canadian goes, what is with these people? They're, they're so efficient, they do everything so well and everything. Um, and yet they have there's no life in them there's no emotion in them you know they, they're not humans anymore like and, and I don't really mean that to say that that's what French Canadians actually think but I'm sure the thought crosses their mind what motivates these people I don't get it um, ultimately why do they bother living and of course the, the English person looks at the, Can the French Canadian and says well they're just they think with their belly and they don't you know they don't uh, think things through and they're more likely to make a hasty decision and etc 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 and um, you know they're just too emotional to be actually trusted with anything um, now that's of course pretty offensive isn't it it's just just as offensive as saying that an English Canadian has no soul maybe they're both right you know maybe they're both in, from their own perspectives correct in assessing each other but not in an absolute sense only in their own perspectives um, there's that um, quote by, I think it was Mark Twain, um, where he said, um, don't rebuke a fool for saying something, who's saying for, for you expressing an opinion that differs from your own. You might both be wrong. Um, you might both be right. It's possible. I'll um, leave finally with a link to um, a poem called um, The Blind Men and the Elephant. Uh, I would urge anyone who wants to understand perspectivism, I guess, and Syadvada, and or at least just those tools to watch this video and read this, listen to the poem. It's where you can actually be right and wrong at the same time, and both right and wrong at the same time, and neither right nor wrong. It um, It's a very, uh, I don't know, it's a humbling thing to read, <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm known for my humility, by the way. <laughs>